Friday Forum Conversation Cafe of the semester. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, and for being patient with us as we navigate hybrid programming in general and figuring out Zoom and in-person audiences. Uh, and thank you to all of our sponsors throughout the entire, there we are, the entire semester um, for your support. A uh, couple of quick things. Uh, this is the last week of our program. Uh, feel free to visit either of our offices, the University and Social Justice Education. We're up on the second floor if you ever want to visit us. And then we'll be sending out an evaluation link for everyone in person and online sometime next week. If you could fill that out and help us continue improving our program. Uh, now I'm going to pass it to Anne, who will introduce our speakers for today. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I know lots of people in the room, but not everybody. I do want to just note, I'm Ann Rasmus. I'm associate director here at the uh, YMCA. This has been a really cool semester and actually year-long partnership with the Office of Diversity and Social Justice Education here at the university. They're housed in our building, so we get to rub elbows with them a lot, um, and they do really, really good work. So we really appreciate connecting with Diversity and Social Justice Education all year this year for the Friday Forum slash Conversation Cafe um, series. It's been awesome. So thank you, Michelle and Chris and Terrell and Jacob for your work. This, as Michelle noted, this is the last one for the series. Um, we typically do a fall series and a spring series. This year we have done a, kind of an arcing series that is all about um, racism, looking at it from lots of different perspectives. It's likely that some form of that theme will continue for next year, so watch for that. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it very much. Okay, so um, we have with us this morning several people that we're excited to have um, as speakers and, a, and as a panel today. I'm going to do an introduction first of Dr. Ken Salo. Ken does not like formal introductions, but I'm going to do a little bit of that anyway because I think it just gives a little context for who he is and how he comes about this work. And then he will introduce the other speakers who are here as a part of the Unit 4 staff. So, Dr. Ken Salo is a social justice educator. He is part of the Department of Urban and Regional Planning here on campus. Um, he's an educator whose teaching practice engages students in dialogues about their lived experiences, negotiating social and spatial injustices of urban livelihoods, both in and beyond conventional classrooms. And I know from um, watching Ken and, and, and reading about his work over a long period of time, that can be anything from church basements to parks to parking lots to any variety of different spaces. Um, he centers and situates the lived experiences of learners um, as locations within racialized social and spatial hierarchies and challenges them to reframe their stories as pathways toward anti-racist futures delinked from past racisms of uneven urban developmental processes. He believes that learners best develop the competencies necessary for social justice work through collaborative and cross-cultural dialogues that create living archives of stories from which to curate arguments for alternative futures. Ken teaches the power of counter-narratives and counter-mapping methods that recenter the placemaking practices of displaced urban collectives. He requires that his students and other learners declare their social positions, identify points of confusion in readings, and seek to clarify them through dialogue with their peers. Dr. Salo creates a courageous space as opposed to a safe space for difficult dialogues with their differently racialized peers. It won't surprise you to know um, that Dr. Salo is a longtime and valued member of the Board of Governors of the University YMCA, um, which shares his aspiration for courageous space and good, sometimes difficult, dialogue. To that end, we have Dr. Salo here together with Dr. Angela Ward, Brenda Taylor, and Sheldon Turner, all of the Unit 4 School District. We're super excited we could get you guys all here today. I know it takes some significant scheduling to make this happen. Thank you for being here. Um, they are here today to speak on the topic in the wake of Unit 4's resolution beyond racism. I want to note a couple of extra housekeeping details for this week. 
first, our guests will be here until 1.15. Um, so it's a little longer than usual. If you're here for a specified amount of time and you need to leave at one o'clock as we advertise, you're welcome to leave at one o'clock. You're not being rude. Um, but they, they do have a little extra time and will be here with us until 1.15 today. So we do appreciate their time. Uh, the second thing is that we are so pleased to be able to continue to offer the opportunity for online audience to hear and view today's forum. But due to our technical constraints, we won't be offering an interactive experience with questions and answers online. We'll rely on all of our in-person attendees to ask all of those good questions. So, thank you all for being here. Thanks very much, and Rasmus, please give a hand. She's an amazing organizer um, for helping me set this up. So, and for that generous introduction. So, as Anne said, my whole pedagogy and philosophy is opening up a dialogue. So it's really not a, 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 a lecture so much as, so I hope that that's what we will achieve today. I'm very blessed and pleased to roll with this posse year that I've had over time. And as you can see, we stacked, so I'm gonna try and be as brief as possible. My role here is to do two things, at least. Um, I will hopefully set the stage, the, the uh, talk we titled in the wake of the Unit 4 Resolution Against Racism. Uh, thanks for coming up. We weren't able to get, again, amongst other things, the Unit 4 School Board. We have to give them a shout out for what they did. I want to set the context for that, for that uh, uh, resolution. It happened during a time of a pandemic. It happened during unprecedented protests against uh, police violence or racism, the Black Lives Matter moment, uh, which is now also part of a, a sort of movement. So that sort of context of that moment is what I'm wanting to try and give you a broader sketch. Um, I'm, I have a video clip to kind of take us back, you know, a little while, maybe five or six decades you know, ago, where similar issues uh, emerged. And the framing that I want to suggest that my colleagues um, uh, will roll out is this relationship between school desegregation and urban or city or residential segregation. And there has been attempts over time to kind of get at this. And so in short, it's about unfinished business. All right? And why is it so difficult? Um, and this, I think, fittingly comes towards the end. I hope it's not the last of the undoing racism series, because clearly this is a very entrenched, persistent problem. So I don't think anybody here, at least, you know, who's got air my color is under any illusion that racism is something that's going to you know, go away tomorrow. Right, it's intent, but I think there's also the idea that yes, we can do something about it, and I think collectively, and so the social justice mission, and I think the why, for my money, is one of the uh, places where these dialogues and also praxis happen. There's a lot of student groups who put this stuff uh, 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 in action. So, um, well, let me get on with, with what I promised to do. Um, let me first give you a metaphor, why I think it's important uh, to, kind of be, to connect, I mean, this is a very difficult, but it's also a very dangerous moment this generation is living in. I don't need to remind you of all of the multiple overlapping conflicts that are worldwide. It's almost dystopian, right? And they seem to be one rolling into each, each other. But the idea is then, how do we see and make connections between the current moments and the, and the historical uh, context. You know, students now are equipped with a lot of uh, gadgets uh, and to document an event as it happens in the moment, but it doesn't quite get at where did it all begin. All right, it didn't begin at that place and at that time. So George Floyd didn't begin there, it got longer antecedent histories. But the metaphor I want to share with you is from one of my favorite Caribbean um, I think it's uh, uh, um, CLR James. So my colleagues would normally say, there's a famous text that we want to introduce you reading from uh, James, <laughs> right? Uh, of course, CLR James. Why is this relevant? Because 
in my native country of South Africa, there's another moment, June 16th, that we will reflect, and this is going to be re invoked. But also, I hope this year to dovetail this with an event on June 19th, which of course is the Juneteenth, so stay posted on that. But let me leave you with an insightful meta for by C.L.R. James, the very famous uh, Caribbean Marxist who wrote, amongst other things, I think one of the best texts on a much neglected slave rebellion in Haiti, which should still be and is not taught uh, in the US and there are reasons we should ask why have you not heard about the Haitian re rebellion. So anyway, um, he reminds us about struggles against racism and for liberation and I quote, he argues that in a revolution when the ceaseless slow accumulation of centuries burst into a volcanic eruption, the meteoric flares and flights above seem meaningless chaos and lend themselves to infinite caprice and romanticism. All right, so they seem meaningless and chaotic unless the observer can see them as projections of the subsoil from which they come. In other words, what I'm trying to say, we have this image of the volcano. We shouldn't be mesmerized by the flares and flashes of the eruption without asking why and how did that erupt by seeing the ceaseless movements that are below. And this is what I think is so problematic about racism or structural racism, is that the perpetrator is historic. They are no longer around. But it's, as John Powell in the video uh, talks about, there is a historical origin, and he argues, I think, very perceptively. The thing about structural racism in the form of residential segregation right now is that it works by itself. Right? It's, we used to use this metaphor that, you know, when they construct the building, after the building is constructed, they take the scaffolding down. This is, so you don't quite see the method of the construction, and you see, so this house that we built in. Anyway, I think it's critically important for an analysis, to, for students to have a historical understanding, to appreciate why it persists, but also not to be captured by the idea that they can't do anything about it. So I have a 10 minute video here, which we can get rolling, um, just to give you some context about how we got to where we were, in specifically regarding historical residential segregation. <laughs> This is a video that I teach, I highly recommend it. It's called Race the Power of the in California Newsreel. I, I uh, highly recommend it. We usually open up classes that I teach on a race and a segregated space. Don't worry, we only get in about 10 or 10 minutes of this.
47 to 1948, were young ex-GIs whose uppermost concern was taking advantage of the GI Bill and making things better for themselves. Before moving to Navitown, Eric Hausman and his wife Doris lived in a cramped attic apartment in New York City. And when we began to look for an apartment, we found that the apartments were 100, 125, 150 dollars a month. I know that's unbelievable today, but it was too expensive for us. And out here in the town, the mortgage payments were sixty-five dollars a month. James Lowen argues 
in his reflection on why Brahms board didn't work 60 decades ago is that you can't segregate, you can't integrate schools or desegregate schools unless you desegregate the city. So this is the problem that's facing us, right? And there has to be found ways to incentivize for people to move out of their comfort zones, right, into areas that are financially risky. All right, so we can have a better distribution. And the logic right now, so that's the take home. Integrated neighborhoods are financial social risks. And so we're living in a segregated city, also known as a sundown town, or where I grew up with a apartheid city, and it's not a surprise that in apartheid towns and apartheid cities, you have apartheid schools. All right, with that introduction, I want to give you an, ascent, an uh, idea of what is the challenge that's facing us. This is the structural racism that's built into the financialized financializing our homes. This racial wealth gap has just grown. Right? Many of us are from the middle class. We own wealth through homes. The elite who I mean they need some you know outer space. They own stocks and bonds. I'm sure many people here don't get their own stocks. <laughs> I'm not sure that's on the, the canvas. But housing Right, and wealth, the wealth gap as it escalates and increases is part of the underlying problem. So with that, I'm going to invite the, my the colleagues from Unit 4 to share what are some of the consequences that they deal with at school as a result of that, right? Att attempts to integrate that. So let me invite Dr. Angelo Ward to share with us what they've done in the wake of the recent resolution. Thank you so much. Sorry for taking so much. Biases had sorted them. 
And as we went through the students' records, what we found is some students were able to be leaders, but they were not recognized as scholars. So I recall looking at a colleague of mine, turning in frustration, saying to her, do you even tell me that we don't have not, you know, five gifted black boys? Because we had lowered the threshold of five at that point, guys, because we couldn't find anyone. I said, we can't find five students that would be able to be seen as scholars in sixth grade at 12. They're written off already. And I never, I never forget the way she looked at me and she kind of nonchalantly said, it certainly appears that way. Well, of course, I was a challenge to our school. And at that point, we took our five students and then we filled the rest of our spaces with other students that uh, met low income guidelines or other um, racial and ethnic uh, backgrounds. Fast forward, it wasn't until we had one of our scholars, Shrew Rakha at the moment, who was teaching a segregated honors class because we still had remnants of an all honors school there, who ran down the hallway and said, these other students are outpacing my traditional gifted students. And after that point, it broke something in our schools. We started to realize that we were randomly sorting students for no reason. So with that being said, Abbott was one of the first pieces we brought in, and it still took decades before we moved and began to bring it throughout our entire system. And I can tell you more about that story, but I'm talking a lot off so we can save time. Fast forward, the consent decree ended, and like a lot of people, we went back to domes and things. I think you talked about Dr. Salo. When the structure is there, you don't have to do a lot of scaffolding on the outside to keep the structure in place. So what we found is that we resorted again, right? Sometimes you shift back into things that are just commonplace. And um, our recent board noticed that we were going back as far as our achievement, back as far as our segregation, lack of students represented in honors, and they did something that I figured, feel was really bold and courageous. They, um, they called for a strategic plan, and they asked for a third party to come in to tell us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and let's put a plan in place. And that's what I, I left here for you if you want a copy of it. So the plan is designed to get at the structural pieces that continue to sort our students when we rely on memory or just people. Because like Brown versus Board of Education, sometimes things are slow. That was 1952 when Brown versus Board of Education came into play. I think that everyone started dragging their feet and all types of schemes came to make sure that that didn't happen. And then it was a course that came and said, with experience, this is what we need, we want it to happen. Well, our board did the same thing. And what they did was, outside of the strategic plan, they adopted a resolution. See, George Floyd did something to us, right? The, that need that is on some people's neck has been there a long time. It was a physical manifestation of seeing that with our own eyes that really woke up people on all sides of, of, of the argument, right? White, black, and others. And for the first time, we were having a conversation about who are we really and what are we really up to? As people, as Americans, as educators, as doctors, lawyers, police officers, and we have to wrestle with that in schools every day. Who are we and what are we really up to? Because if you know like I know, a diverse community brings something beautiful. But you can't harness the strength of that if you're too busy focusing, focusing on the divide and finding ways to separate and divide. And I'm telling you, in schools, we still find ways to divide. So the resolution pointed out a couple of things. What it talked about was structurally, uh, addressing the structural racism and dismantling it. I liken it to a rope. Have you all ever seen students play rope, jump rope? If you've ever played double dutch, the rope gets really tangled, right? And if you ever watch the girls when they untangle it, it takes about two or three of them and they talk for a long time and they negotiate and they pull it apart and then so they, so they keep on going and they find the root cause of where things got mixed up in the first place and all of a sudden you can play. Well, the undone of racism is a lot like that. There are a lot of pieces and it's entangled, right, and it's deep work. So what our board said was, we don't want a plan in the book. We want the plan to come alive. And so the, the resolution that I also left the copy of said, we want you to go back and we want you to look at root causes. 
We want you to look at how students are separated and get them back into honors classes and invite them in. The teachers, the adults, instead of students begging and knocking on the doors again. We want you to go back into the name of the courses, minority authors. Let us account for a fourth credit course in English. And to say maybe minoritized. And authors are still matter. And it could be a complete credit. They, they also urge us to go back and look at the way our school resource officers engage with our students and how they are partners in serving their to serve and protect. And it also meant that we go back and look at our curriculum scope and sequence, which if you look at the research, it says that there are more references to inanimate objects and animals than there are people of color in the books that we read. So where are the mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors in the schools? We had to go back and look at our staff and our teachers that don't represent our student body. I was one of the only black teachers when I started here in 1994 or 5, I think they catch a lot of people here. And Champaign is a very diverse community. So those are the things the resolution asks us to go back and look at. So Abbott came into play, and Abbott was met with fierce, fierce pushback. Because it required that every student that was eligible or able to get a C or above get access to an honors or dual credit class. And I had parents who were upset, who would count the number of students in the classroom, and they were wondering why those students took that seat from their scholars. We also got pushback from teachers who said that now my class is diversified, it is watered down. It is no longer honors at all. Reminds you a lot like the redlining conversation we're having, right? Instead of looking at the richness in what students bring, they look at the deficits and students taken away. So that's a little history of Abbott and why we brought Abbott into, into place, because it was a structural change. Imagine you have a course that has to find 25 to 50 students in each grade level that may not look like the traditional students who have a teacher that invites them into that space and allows them to be a part of the conversation that could change the game for what we call the American experience. Research says that we could save, we could save and, and increase trillions of dollars in economic development, growth, and income if we could just get a more diverse perspective on what it is we're trying to achieve. So I'm going to pause right there and I'm going to let Brenda talk to you about Abbott and unpack it a little more because it, it, it sounds like a philosophy, but it's really just what grandparents do. It's probably what your parents or family did to get you here. Make no mistake about it, a lot of it is just about having social capital. It's a lot of that. So Brenda Taylor, who is our new director of Abbott, will tell you a little bit about that. And then later Sheldon Turner, who um, talks a little bit about the spill out when things don't get addressed on time, will tell you about the other programs we had to bring in place to address and undo this, uh, in this tangled bit of a mess we have ourselves. Uh, Avid is a program that 
It kind of fills in the gaps. It's not a program, it's a system of support that helps to fill in the gaps for students who don't have those uh, supports at home. Students like me when I was their age. Uh, so I do everything that I do for students and I have great people that I work with at Unit 4 uh, to keep students in first place. We look at the data and the data doesn't lie. When we look at those achievement gaps, when we see the disparities between our black and brown students and our non-black and brown students, when we see the achievement gaps between students who uh, receive free or reduced lunch and those who don't, we have to do better, right? And then I, I do what I do for teachers because I believe that teachers are on the ground. And we have to empower our teachers and build that capacity within our district and within our schools because they are the ones who are on the front line with those kids, giving them what they need. I came into education not the traditional route. I had a background in corporate. I was a commercial account executive working in downtown Chicago. I had a very kind of comfortable life. I enjoyed traveling. I enjoy kind of setting my schedule. I networked a lot, met a lot of people. It was fun, and yet I always felt like something was missing. And that something was the connection, right? I didn't feel like I was doing meaningful work. And so I went and I got certified to be a high school biology teacher. And I took a job at a school with no air conditioning, and I never looked back. It was the absolute best thing because the work that we do for kids is just the most important work, right? Um, my personal experience also shaped me, right? I told you a little bit about I was that kid, right? And so the fact that I had some amazing teachers and that I had some amazing resources and opportunities in my childhood that allowed me to get on a different trajectory empowers me and inspires me to do the work that I do because I know it's easy to go down the wrong road. And for me to be in a position with AVID and college and career readiness in general with Unit 4 allows me to guide students, to establish pathways and make sure that each student that leaves Unit 4 schools has a plan, a solid post-secondary plan, right? And so what is AVID? AVID stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. That's huge, right? And how do we, how do, we do AVID? So uh, we have nine AVID sites right now with Champaign Unit 4. We've got four elementary. We've got three demo sites. Um, and those are our middle schools. And then the two high schools, Centennial and Central. Our AVID students are immersed in an experience that involves uh, our rigor strategies, writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. They are empowered to, uh, to believe in themselves and take personal responsibility and ownership for their education. Twice a week they go through tutorials where they bring uh, questions from their content areas uh, that they may be struggling with. And they work through these questions during these tutorials or these academic discussions to kind of teach them how to problem solve. And not only that, it gives them uh, encouragement or helps them to feel more comfortable standing in front of people and speaking in front of people and advocating for themselves and critical thinking and learning how to solve their problems. Advancement via individual determination. The college and career theme is huge. We want our students at the elementary level on up thinking about what's next. What am I gonna do after high school, right? And so you'll walk through our schools and you'll see the, the pennants in the, in the classrooms and in the hallways. You'll see the teachers uh, posting outside their door their educational experience, right? I want to do things like uh, parades where our students are
are looking into what their next will uh, be. Organization is huge. Um, not just the physical organization of work, but organization of thoughts. Right? Because when we look at it, and I'm not trying to say that habit in and of itself or education in and of itself is going to tear down that racism that exists, right? Because you can be educated, you can have that degree, but we still come against these challenges um, in this society. But what we're doing is helping to level the ground a little bit, empowering our students to be critical thinkers, to stand up for themselves, and to be prepared for what's next. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Sheldon Turner, who is going to talk a little bit about Operation Hope. Thank you. I am the hope of the future. I am educated. I know my identity. I am a leader, not a follower. I am responsible. I will honor those that paved the way for my success. Dr. Moore, do you remember you helped me put that class together? That was about four years ago. So my name is Sheldon Turner. Uh, I work with two programs in the district. One is Operation Hope, the other one is Goal Getters. Um, and both programs focus on what I just said. I am the hope of the future. What does that mean? I, I, you know, what does that mean to you, being the hope of the future? I have a lot of young ladies and young men that have felt that they've had no hope. You know, they, they grew up in neighborhoods like the neighborhood that I grew up in, in East St. Louis, uh, Illinois, very poor, you know, um, no hope. Knowing their identity, that's a powerful message right there. Who are you? Sometimes in the mirror and you ask yourself, who am I? These young men and women, they really don't, some of them don't actually know who they are. And they don't learn who they are until we instill things like we have uh, as one of our models in our operation home program is a 4 e model. That's education, exposure, experience, and engagement. We want to give them all four of those components of, that pro of, this, of, the, of our programs. Uh, I often think about, you know, the things that they got going on in their lives, and they have so many things. I know you all probably have a lot of things, but these young women and men, they have a lot more. And so, you know, the segregation, the racial issues, and all of that, that's only a small portion of some of the things that they go through. Uh, think about what they're going to eat. You know, where are they going to sleep? Are they going to wake up and someone has just shot up a, ho a house next door to them? A lot of that stuff you all don't have to worry about. You know, we don't have to think about that. But I can remember getting my house shot up, you know, when I was about seven years old, running through the house. Didn't know, you know where to go. And bullets have no eyes, no names on them. They just went out and they travel all over the place. Um, Gold Getters is one of the programs that we started in the in, in year before. That was created um, about three years ago. Uh, some of y'all might have remembered. There was a, a shooting that took place at Central High School. We had a lot of, actually it was Central against Danville, I believe. A lot of them, so we had a lot of people there at that game. Um, and there was a shooting. And so the shooting was caused by some uh, wannabe gang members. I call them wannabes, because they don't, a lot of them don't really know what gangs are until we talk, talk to them about what their identity really is. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I sat back and I thought about theirs. There should be something done about the gang problems um, in every community. And so we came up with this goal getters idea. And what that do is it just help them focus on identity and you know, a lot of mental health issues. You know, a lot of them deal with lots of trauma. They grew up around uh, traumatic experiences. You know, they may have seen someone in their families get shot or killed, they may have seen a family member that was on drugs. And so we get people and, and we put pla two things in place for them so that they can feel that they're somebody. You know, everybody in here wants to feel like they're somebody. And every last one of my young women and men 
they feel like they're somebody when they go through our programs. I'm not trying to brag, but Operation Hope, our program has been going on for 12 years, and our uh, graduation rate is 11% higher than the school district's high school rate for our students. So that means that we're doing something with these young men and women to get them to understand what college experiences, and, and not even college experiences, but career experiences is all about. That's pretty much what uh, I had. I would love to get some of y'all's questions. Thank you. One more shout out to this amazing panel. Thank you so much. I think we have 10 minutes for QA. I don't know if there's anybody who wants to. There's a hand in the back. And I'm not sure if you pass the mic or there's a rolling mic there. I've been a long time follower of the IUN4, and I'm happy to hear the um, review of this history. My question is, what, what has changed since last summer? Because Abbott's been around for a while, and Mr. Turner's been working for a while uh, with the allocation of resources and priorities. Has there been a, a boost? Are you getting that specifically to Sheldon or anybody? I don't care. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe Ms. Ford. Oh, you're asking what changed for Abbott since last, since the past? No, with, with, um, what all changed to make, to make the resolution have feet and really act, you know, move and. So, so what we did was we revisited a lot of the data with the strategic plan and what it did was illuminated what we saw was that resegregating, that regression of work. And, and then what happened is they reorganized central office and who's in charge of what. Um, they also put requirements on the financial department to um, look at their allocation and funding for schools. And uh, with the resolution, they also gave power to different groups to go back and maybe look at like the curriculum, spoken sequence, for example, um, looking at African studies and things like that, for example. We didn't come here to change, but that's where a lot of our history picks up, right? Like, so even looking at the books, in the curriculum that we share with students. So it's, it's multi-pronged. A lot of things have moved around and changed, as well as like a digital dashboard to start monitoring and following a lot more closely, re implementing some things that we had in place when we were under uh, working with the court. So getting there before we, we, we're being told, doing that on our own, because we know that's what we're supposed to do for students. Um, but the work still has to happen. Well, with me, I, you know, change, I mean, it's, it's like, I mean, it's some, of my, some of my young men, I mean, they, they, they don't know what change is, uh, unless you actually give them the opportunity to come back on the campus of the University of Illinois to see if they can possibly be a, a University of Illinois students. A lot of them don't feel like they could be, you know, for many reasons. They, they feel like they, they can't be a University of Illinois student. So I try to change their mindset by bringing them and exposing them to places like the University of Illinois so they can see people that look just like them. And then, then they'll know that they can possibly change their mindset. I wonder if this may be an opportunity to allocate Mike Sheldon um, to share. There was a hopefully uh, trending video. So the pandemic did put a focus on the way that issues are being covered, right? So the, the role of the media, and you are on a panel with uh, Tiger about uh, the first follows, but the, you know, increase in the crisis of gun violence. Do you want to just share your reflection at that point about the problem with the media coverage? Yeah, so Victory Over Violence is the, the thing that we, the series that we did with WCIA. And I challenged WCIA, and actually they have been doing better. I challenged them with more positive stories about our young black men, because it's not always but, I mean, you've probably seen two black young, two black faces within the last two weeks, or within the last two days, in the front page of the paper or in the, you know, on WCIA. So I'm pushing out more positive messages so that these young, our, our kids can understand it ain't all about the negative that they see, that there are some positive messages, that some positive things going on. Uh, was one of the things that I challenged WCIA with. 
also, before, it leaves, before everybody leaves too, one of the biggest piece is number three in our strategic plan, which is about community engagement. So being able to invite our community in, and I also see that happening with Chancellor, Chancellor Ward and the compact and other things like that. Being a university student here, I can tell you there's a deep divide between town and gown, and it's not intentional coming to school. But you know, there's a history where this town put it the gown, and when students couldn't have spaces to be on this campus. And so while we're trying to support our larger community, we also want to support our university community. For Abbott, we need tutors. Uh, what do we give back in this space that we share? Before we leave, we go back home. And so that's one of the biggest reasons why we, we brought Brenda and Shelby here, because we need that to be a community effort to change. Thank you so much. Huh? All right. Lastly, I'm reminded from your question, I don't know how many of you know as about Samuel Clemens, also better known as Bob Twain, had this famous saying that his school interfered and interrupted his education. Right? And so the project here, of course, is to change the schooling so that it serves your education. And then the purpose of education is to change. So don't let your schooling you know, interrupt or interfere with your education. It's just that you get the education you deserve, and particularly for your young people. So thank you so much from our side for participating. If you're interested, um, this is the strategic plan that Dr. Ward brought to know. But why don't you help me? It's copies over there. Please help me thank our panelists, the YMCA, the host of this. And we all around the next five minutes or so if you want to come and you know, meet and greet in person with the wonderful panel. Thank you so much.